it was a very dangerous time. There was the anti-war demonstrations and our government was sort of at a loss of how do you deal with so many young people who have become so radicalized. For some people like myself, meditation didn't do much. These early hippies said you could go backwards in time. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of cool. I'll go backwards in time. And they gave me a pill. They told me it was LSD. The 60s was coming out to the end of the Vietnam War. The protest against that war, the rebellion in the country, America was beginning to lose its moral rudder. a cultural movement to have sex and do drugs and feel good and eliminate tradition. Along uh, 5 Freeway it said, keep the highways clean, pick up a hippie. It was Lennon who said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. And that got an outcry, but the sad thing was that uh, he was probably correct. There was just a total upheaval uh, by the young people against uh, the uh, established society. Right on, right on, right on. That's my girl. Yeah, she's uh, <laughs> your girl. She's <laughs> dancing. She seems like uh, any animals. Or her the counterculture was a real problem for the church. Counterculture meant un-American. Hippie and communism just about meant the same to them, you know, because there was this communal kind of living that went on. When I began surfing in 1973, it was the pinnacle of counterculture. It was identified with smoking pot, not having a job, doing whatever you want, uh, no responsibilities, and, and, and a good portion of the surfers in the early 70s were just hippies. They're just, they're, they're hybrids. They're hippie surfers. moments in time that turn the pages of history, when the fate of a nation hangs in the balance. The 1960s were such a time in America as the post-war baby boom generation was coming of age. Revolution was in the air, cities were on fire, and campuses were inflamed with the counterculture. This country was being torn apart. But that radical course was being changed, and one of the forces responsible was a massive shift toward Christianity, the Jesus movement. For millions, this was an invisible, almost irresistible force. A riptide. In a time when everything was questioned. But the people that use LSD are not drug addicts. Uh, we're not dope fiends. We're not criminal types. We're people who have found a new way to make meaning in our lives. 70 million baby boomers took the stage and shook America. A disruption in, in life as we knew it in, in the United States, it was uh, from anarchy from one end to party and to the other end and everything in between. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I started out when I was 14 years old. I was trying to fill that hole that, it's a cliche, the hole in my heart, but I had one, a big one. I'd done the cocaine. You know, the girls, the, the, the marijuana, the party, and, and the NFL, and all that stuff. And I said, that does not satisfy. We were inches away from disaster. But another revolution was on the horizon. Misfits became ministers, and a new movement towards Jesus was born. Riptide is going contrary to the general direction of the water. The waves are going toward the beach. The riptide is going out to sea. So it's a counterculture thing. It's contrary to the flow. A riptide can be a great thing. It can be a way out. Young hippie kids were coming to Christ. Kids were getting their lives turned around and getting up drugs and all the rest of it. 
and in changing the course of their life. Part of it had to do with, with Watergate. Part of it had to do with the hippie movement. Part of it had to do with Vietnam. Part of it had to do with a counterculture that was love. If there was something about the hippie culture that was very conducive uh, you know, to the gospel. We were born in a revolution. You know, it was, they called it the Jesus Revolution. I think once you've got sort of revolutionary blood in you, it's, it's there for life. Not too far from where, where we are here in this desert scene, uh, there was a whole group of people from the West Coast that not only in Berkeley or Haight-Ashbury, but in the deserts of Southern California, were seekers of quote-unquote truth of God, of nirvana, uh, they were looking through uh, psilocybin, mescaline, LSD, marijuana, and things like that were small time. I had no idea, thinking ahead, that there was anything other than the normal, going to have fun today and uh, go to a party. I can remember hearing the gravel a little bit crunching underneath. And I just thought, what's the day have to hold? And when I opened the door and walked in, I saw all strangers, some of them with, you know, hair down to their waist, some of the guys with robes on and beards. I thought, a little bit weird. But little did I know that death was waiting there for me. Whoa! Joey Buran is a Calvary Chapel pastor in Orange County, California, not far from Huntington Beach, Surf City, USA. I definitely was very fearless, and, and most particularly at the pipeline. It's a very unique way because it's a tunnel. It's that, what they call a tube, and you get in there and you get shot out like getting shot out of a cannon, and that was my strength. It's always about the next wave, the next swell, the endless summer, all those kind of things. So when I got into surfing, I thought it was the same thing. It was kind of like counterculture. I'm not going to go to some war. I'm not going to be called a jarhead and all this stuff. And it's like, but then in the end, I became the most selfish person imaginable. I stole my college bombs from my dad to run away to Hawaii. You know, I became uh, the very culture that I was, a selfish, uh, self-absorbed culture. And I, and I was a product of it, even though I thought I was against it. Winning the Pipeline Masters in 1984 was huge in my life to come into a personal faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what I lived for. It's all that mattered to me. And on that day when I won it, uh, after I won, in a matter of moments, everyone left the beach. I was all by myself. And, and I just remember at that moment, just it, it was like one of those life epiphany moments where it's just like, there has to be more to life than this. I was the only one at this house that didn't know anybody. I was the stranger. Who's the kid? I ain't some friend. <laughs> I'm Mike. Have a beer, man. Don't shake my hand. It's a party. But by 8 o'clock, my brains were frying, and I knew that I was dying. I just, uh, I knew I was near death. I'm too high. <laughs> too high. I was the outsider. I didn't fit. It wouldn't have been a group of people I would have normally chosen to be with, but the friend that introduced me, I trusted him. You listen to me, I'm too high. Okay, hey, man, remember, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> there, have a beer. <laughs> Shut up, man. <laughs> are you listening to me, anything I'm saying? Um, can, I, can you call the hospital for me, please? I'm ODing and I don't know if it's... <laughs> Call somebody for me, please. I call Rod. Get, get, get on. Yeah, please. Rod. I used to watch these guys. I, I liked them. They were kind of funny guys because they took themselves too seriously. And I liked that part of it because I just thought life was a party and everybody should have be having fun all the time. Hey, buddy. That's right, more than I usually do. And I'm going to be okay. I think I'm OD. This, why are you moving right. me out of your hands? It's going to be okay. Yeah. Just... Right. I found him in the desert. <laughs> Bob 
McCoy is among those with a dramatic conversion prior to becoming pastor of a large church. Becoming a candidate for Christ for everyone is a journey. My journey included working in the record industry. Now, what that means is connections at parties, connections with people, connections with uh, the kinds of experiences that on the one hand make me look very, very popular to the outside world. On the inside, I realize I'm just starting to die. Because with all the alcohol and all the cocaine, um, it's taking its toll on me internally, but externally, I look like I'm the life of the party. But let me tell you what the love of God looks like. You'll be like the Most High when you love, listen to this, the wicked or the ungrateful. You ever let somebody in on traffic? Go ahead, come on in. What are you waiting for? You're waiting for that obligatory, oh, thank you so much. It's so nice for you to let me in. Thank you very, very much. But whenever you let somebody in, if they blow you off, I will never let anyone in in front of me as long as I live, you ungrateful. God says, I love them. Bob Coy without Jesus Christ would either be in jail, uh, he would be um, six feet under, or he would be, and I'm seriously when I say this, he'd be crazy because I was truly on the highway to hell. The leader, what I thought hallucinating, was loading a pistol, and they said they were going to kill me. Mark, come here, man. I got something for you. Come on. It's all right. Everything's going to be cool. bag over my head, shoved me on a couch, and I just went. I was gone. I knew I was going to die. Remember what I told you? You got to see the light. It's all around you. Vietnam was an explosive and divisive issue in the 1960s. On campus and in the streets, protests roared across the country. The Jesus movement played a very vital part in bringing America back to a solid foundation. When we got to Vietnam, we were heading the coast, and I could hear the flashes. I, I can remember seeing the flashes and hearing the boom, boom, the black, you know, the, kind of the, the, the whole 105s and all that. And I, I was thinking, man, here I am now. First time out of the country, and I'm in Vietnam. As we were in this area of this village, where the Viet Cong were dug in. Pete Silva goes over this wall, over this gate, as we're following, not the trail, but out of the trail, because they will be trapped. And he steps over the gate and steps right into a hole where there's a booby trap and blows both of his legs off. I went just berserk, went crazy, and the captain called me in and they sent me, to Oak, they sent me down to Da Nang to see the psychologist. And I told the psychologist that if he would not get me out of Vietnam, I would kill him. When I came back from Vietnam, I could not believe it, man. The rebellion that was going on. I mean, there were guys getting off planes at the airports and taking off their uniforms because, you know, they were, they were being spit up on. And I mean, I thought, man, if somebody spits on me, I will kill them. I don't care what they say, you know? And I was just so bitter, so angry. These mystics that I trusted in, gave money to, and chanted to, and turned my bed to face the east so the power would come to me and all that. They all appeared like at one time in this outer darkness and began to laugh. And I said, take me to God. And in unison, I heard him say, this is as far as we take man, is death. I remember coming out of there thinking my head was missing and telling him, you've got to help me. Give me the hospital, I've just been shot.
the next week I turned myself in to the Laguna Beach Police Department and they took me to the Orange County Medical Center and they put me in the mental hospital. And interacting with other people, I found out, okay, I'm alive, but still my left side of my head's missing. Why is that? I came home and I saw her bags packed. I had three boys. I'm going to kill her and then I'm going to kill my boys and I'm going to have the cops kill me and it'll be a done deal. I went into the, my closet, got my rifle, loaded it up, waited for Sharon to come home. All of a sudden I was breaking the house down and I hit the television with the end of the butt, the, the butt of the rifle. The TV came on and it was Pastor Chuck Smith. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature and they'll say, wow, far out, oh, let's bury it, you know. <laughs> Chuck's giving a, a message with Catherine Kuhlman and the Jesus people. And he's talking about God's love and God's grace. And I want to shoot him and I can't pull the trigger. And all of a sudden, the word of God, the Holy Spirit, I didn't know this at that time, began to pierce my heart. And the message began to speak to me. This little chapel, Calvary Chapel, held 350 people at its max. There might have been 800, 900 people in there. And they would bring people on stretchers, or friends would carry three or four hippies that were stoned out of their head, or people that had overdosed and they were crippled. And the, uh, Chuck Smith and the p pastors and elders would pray for him, and they would walk out. My first exposure to Pastor Chuck Smith was an interesting one. Showing up at the Costa Mesa property, feeling a sense of acceptance and home, I can't describe it to you any other way. I can just tell you that when I walked into the building, I felt like I was welcome there, even though no one physically welcomed me. So I went up after him and I said, I think the whole side of my face is missing. I have 24 hour flashbacks. I hear the gun go off every night. I run into the street and honey be screaming. And they said, well, let's pray. And they prayed for me that night. The radical thing for me, getting saved as a, as a top surfer in the world. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I became counterculture to my culture. There's a life worth living. And that is a life you find when you give up the life you can't keep. As I was sitting there, and these five or six men laid their hands on me and just asked Jesus to have mercy on me. With my eyes closed, it was like a lightning bolt went from the left side of my head to the right side. And then this little quiet voice, it said, Michael, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind. But love, power, and a sound mind. Many of these young people that you see have had rather sordid backgrounds. They've been in drugs, they've been in prostitution, they've been in everything you could possibly think about. Baptism in the Christian sense actually signifies a burying of the old life. When I went to uh, Corona Del Mar and was baptized, I knew that that day that my life was completely changed. And I understood that when I was going to be put down in that water, that it was a recognition that the Lord Jesus was put down in a grave because he has murdered on a cross for every wicked thing I did. Since that day at Corona Del Mar, Mike McIntosh has traveled the world preaching the gospel that saved his life. You're going to live forever because the Lord has died and paid the price for your sins. We were blessed to be able to see God moving in the lives of so many young people. And then, of course, the young people became the evangelists to their peers. Calvary Chapel was not the only group of new churches to be birthed during the dynamic days that Time Magazine branded as the Jesus Movement. Decades later, however, Calvary Chapel has survived and thrived, making it possible to trace its growth and examine what began in a small church in Orange County and would become a global movement. You, Lord, have taken this little congregation, and from it, you have touched the whole world. You've got a bunch of kids who didn't want to be controlled, and they didn't have that sort of loving, benevolent father figure. Along comes a man who is a benevolent, loving father figure, and who's about influence, not control. So often, the churches, we shut our doors, and we point the guns out and we go, no, 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 clean up before you come in. It's like a hospital saying, no, no, you're bloody. You need to clean up. When you come in, then we'll work on you. So much of the Calvary uh, Chapel movement has been its focus on loving the unlovable, on reaching out to the spiritually confused. People like I was, you didn't give up on the likes of me. Rules without relationships leads to rebellion. Discipline without relationships leads to bitterness and anger. 
they were tired of rules and regulations. If you remember, the clothing manufacturers were going broke because the hippies did not buy shoes, they bought sandals or they were bare feet and bought Levi's and t-shirts and grew their hair so barbers were having a hard time. Lonnie Frisbee was the man who served as a bridge to the hippie generation. Lonnie Frisbee was the man who was preaching when I accepted Christ and God really used him and I think in all fairness we have to give him his proper place in the Jesus movement. He was a catalyst that was used by God in his day. Lonnie was a quiet, uh, meek uh, man, gentle, frail. Um, uh, he had uh, a lot of charisma. Lonnie was actually preaching the night that I gave my heart to Jesus. He had a way of just drawing people into a response. While at the same time, when you got around him, you would realize this man's life is very unstable. One of the young men, Catherine, who has been so used of God is Lonnie Frisbee. And I wonder if Lonnie could just share with us some now. Well, the people tell me that I'm trying to look like Jesus. I can't think of anybody else I'd rather look like. <laughs> Jesus, he changed my life, and I, I kind of relate it to like David the psalmist when he says that thou hast lifted me up from the dunghill, and he has placed my feet on a solid rock. He is not well founded just in his, in his character, in his walk, in his maturity, and yet he, when he would get up and call people to Christ, I mean, it's like he, he, he could put on this persona about him. Lonnie began spectacularly but ended tragically. If Chuck Smith became the long-burning center of Calvary Chapel, Lonnie Frisbee was the explosion used to ignite the fire. Lonnie Frisbee died of AIDS in 1993. David said, it was you, my own friend. We went into the house of the Lord together. You know, if it was an enemy that had done it, I could handle it, uh, but it was you. And I think that uh, that criticism that comes from those that know you closely, those that you have fellowship with, is more difficult uh, to handle, but yet to realize that my responsibility is not even to my closest associate. I'm gonna answer to Jesus Christ one day because I serve Him. And I have to be faithful and obedient to what He speaks to my heart of what I should do even if it does cost me a close relationship. I never felt as though Chuck was talking down to us. I just felt like he was talking to us. And you know, the interesting thing is there were other kids my age, so I related to them on a certain level. I couldn't relate to Chuck on the level of you're cool or you're young, but I related to him on the level of you're authentic, you're real, you love God, and man, you really know that Bible well. Chuck was was very much a short hair guy. The freaks were all long hairs, bare feet. None of that would ever be allowed in church. And so he took down the barriers. These kids were attracted to Chuck because I think of his simplicity, his honesty, and he just opened the scripture and just taught verse by verse, and, and these kids just soaked it up. But I remember my mother said when she left, someone asked her, what did you think of that experience? She said, I was fed this morning. As far as sacrifice, uh, ongoing continual commitment, um, not just to be a flatterer, but that's the one thing that I really, really, really appreciate about Chuck Smith. He's still preaching the Bible and pastoring a church. There's what Eugene Peterson calls long obedience in the same direction. People who were used mightily and have been used mightily in these things have never tried to be celebrities. They just get on with it. They just do it because they love Jesus and they get good at it. And uh, if they keep it that way, then God will use it for, to great ends. But because it's uh, become a career move now. I think it's took the, uh, the simplicity and the sweetness of it. It is not unusual for new religious movements to rise up quickly, attract attention, and then disappear almost as fast. What has made churches such as Calvary Chapel unique is not a marketing strategy, but a set of distinctives that is firmly centered on a great non-negotiable truth 
The Bible is God's inerrant message of love and salvation to all mankind. Loving God, that's the chief goal of life. Returning that love to God that he has given to us is the more excellent way. Chuck never started out to start a denomination, and, it, and it's not a denomination today. It's a, more or less a fellowship. And they all have kind of Chuck Smith uh, in common as, as a man they look up to and, and trust and go to when they have problems. But you think of these Calvary chapels, some of the largest churches in America today are churches that have their roots back in Costa Mesa under Chuck Smith's teaching. My first experience with a non-denominational Christian church was Horizon Calvary Chapels. And I had never seen people sing in church like that, never seen people in jeans and casual and, and just talking from the Bible in everyday language. That was my introduction to Christianity. And it was a great introduction. It was very simple and very to the point and very, as a matter of fact, this is where the truth is. And so that's really what changed my life. The hallmark of Chuck Smith has been verse by verse teaching, book by book, chapter by chapter, through the Bible, every seven years. And this has produced a generation of people who love the Word of God. The added fuel of motivation from teaching about the return of Christ served to accelerate the Jesus movement. I believe that Jesus is coming very soon. The rebirth of the nation of Israel. We have seen Israel beginning to blossom and bud, as Isaiah said, and fill the earth with fruit. We have seen the new leaves coming forth. And Jesus said, when you see that, you know that my coming is at the door. For those who understand what the Bible teaches about Israel, the Temple Mount behind me is more than an ancient monument. It's a symbol of what God has done and what he promises to do. The headlines indicate the time may be short. I think if you could peel the heaven back like a scroll and look into heaven, I think you would see the Lord Jesus Christ mounted with his sword in his hand, ready to return, and we better be ready. The thing that has built the Calvary Chapel movement is adherence to the Word of God. And it also, the lack of God's Word is causing churches to die. It ain't Rock music was the universal language of the youth culture in the USA. But until Calvary Chapel and Maranatha music arrived, this was a dialect that the church in America simply did not speak. The church was making the best art back, you know, hundreds of years ago. Now it seems like maybe, maybe uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a certain safe boundary that people try to stay in. We're on a tour back east. We played a whole set. As Soon as we were done, we sat down, the pastor got up, and began for the next 10 to 15 minutes speak of how we were of the devil and not of the Lord. And we just sat there, dumbfounded. Music in my generation, it was everything. And what do I mean by everything? You found your identity in a band, and then that band established for you how you felt politically, how you felt morally. So your link to the lyrics was now your expression because their expression was where you agreed. Just about the time I started taking drugs, Sergeant Pepper came out and I was looking to all these, these men for answers and I'm uh, trying to follow this path of the way hippies were going, you know, I sold all my possessions and I went to Hawaii. The music of the 60s was a language that changed a whole generation of people and the world's really never been the same since then. So naturally when the Jesus movement started in the late 60s and early 70s, I think it was a language that was a natural fit as well because you had really hundreds of thousands of kids coming out of the counterculture that needed a voice musically. A lot of people don't realize it, but contemporary Christian worship was born in the Jesus movement. It did not exist prior to that. These long-haired, bearded, hippie guys came in, and they said, uh, we are a, a music group, and uh, we've accepted the Lord here a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we have been given, the Lord's been giving us some Christian music, and we wondered if we could maybe share it. I get a feeling that there's a lot of people out there that really love Jesus tonight. 
<laughs> so I said, well, what's, what do you call your group? And they said, well, we're, well, we've always been known as the Love Song. And I said, oh, great, perfect name. And so they played that night and it was just electrifying. Freedom of dress, fresh music, and the love of God, combined with basic Bible teaching, produced an explosive dynamic that was just what a searching generation was looking for. Music is a, it's a language, it's a subculture, it's a style, and it can either attract or repel. And so by being willing to reconsider music in general and its place in the church, I think it kicked open the door. It was an act of hospitality. Another major figure who emerged from the early days of modern Christian music was Keith Green. So many times I've tried to tell you, but I don't think you've been listening. Even within the cross current of the Jesus movement, he resisted the growing commercial trend of Christian music. Because his love is free. The idea that, like, giving your music away, Keith Green, I mean, kind of the originator of all that. Keith burned brightly, but he was cut short by a tragic plane crash in 1984. Jesus says, if we love someone in his name, we're loving him. Say love. In London, Alwyn Wall was moving from the Beatles to the Bible. It was George Harrison who gave us a little book and talked about, his, uh, talked about transcendental med meditation to us. And we got into that whole scene and we were part of that whole kind of hippie rock and roll situation. Playing a little blues rock and roll band, playing Stones, Beatles. The first person that came to me, I remember this guy with the beard the hair, and I thought, this is Jesus. <laughs> it was Greg Laurie. Greg Laurie is pastor of one of the largest churches in America. Since 1990, he has also spoken at Harvest Crusades, large-scale evangelistic outreaches held around the United States and in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. But Laurie's early life made him an unlikely candidate for this kind of career. My own mother died at a fairly early age because her kidneys were failing, she had to get dialysis because of an alcoholic lifestyle. So looking at my family genes and pattern and history, one wonders. I never planned on being a pastor, but uh, this opportunity opened up uh, to do a Bible study with young people. It continued to grow and one thing led to another and I realized in time that the Lord was calling me to be a pastor. And we got talking to Greg about the Lord and uh, he was asking all these questions and the thing that marked that event was, first of all, the sheer size, you know, seeing all these young kids in the church with Bibles ready to hear the Word of God. You know, they've got Bibles, I've never seen Bibles that big. My Bible was little. You know, this was like, you know, you could stand on them, you know. And so they got, I see all these kids with Bibles, long hair, they were just like us. And I thought, I'm home. When we first started the crusade, we were told it wouldn't work. And we did it, and the Lord blessed and it worked. Because everybody wants to uh, say a eulogy over crusade evangelism. Everybody says it's going to end with this person. You know, uh, when uh, D.L. Moody stopped doing his crusades, when he died, they said, this kind of evangelism is gone. Then Billy Sunday came along. And then when he died, they said, this kind of evangelism is over with. Then Billy Graham came along. And now as Billy has finished his ministry, they still say, this kind of evangelism is over with. People won't come to events like this. But I'm ready now. Waiting for your triumph and sweet With the Harvest Crusades, when you see people come forward, and I, that may have been my 27th Harvest Crusade, you know, and I've heard Greg give that message, and I've sung Come Just As You Are more times than I can count, um, and yet God does something new through it every time. So people get ready, Jesus is coming soon. Nails did not hold Jesus to that cross 2,000 years ago. Love did. Love for you. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. It's important to understand that the Jesus Movement did not start at Calvary Chapel. The Jesus Movement started spontaneously around the world. Ransford Obey is a pastor in Kumasi, Ghana, West Africa. I was 
trained as an Assemblies of God uh, pastor and um, one of the things that we were trained is every Sunday morning when you get up you need to make sure that you pump the people up but later on I realized that I can't continue like that because it, some of the things I did was not truly from my heart. And so one day I decided that I was going to teach the Bible. So somebody visited our church and he said, do you know about Calvary Chapel? I said, no. He said, you need to know about uh, Pastor Chuck. It was breaking out here. It was breaking out there. But without question, an epicenter of it, or certainly a center of it, was Calvary Chapel. When I found out that this is exactly what Pastor Chuck was doing, it gave me an encouragement. I ordered for every book that I could get from Pastor Chuck, read it, and it gave me the momentum and the encouragement to know that I am doing the right thing. One thing the Jesus Movement did, it opened up freedom and church planting. I mean, I'm a church planter by heart. I love church planters. And church planting wasn't on the radar. It wasn't incredibly popular until the Jesus Movement came along and new, new wine came and new wine skins were needed. And I think one of the greatest gifts that the Jesus Movement has given the whole church was a renewed sense of interest in church planting. And so that became a global phenomenon. Here in Northern India, we are at a good place for a status report on the state of the Great Commission. How far have we come and what remains to be done? K.P. Yohannan is founder and president of Gospel for Asia. We have now well over 7,500 churches, congregations, and then many thousands of mission stations, of course. We have a broadcast in 103 languages, uh, and over a million people respond to us a year asking for more information about the Lord. You happen to be in the 50% of Indians that are what we would call Dalits. They're in the scheduled, backward, and untouchable caste. Then it's not, it's not the kindness. Uh, you can't go into a Hindu temple because you're unclean, so you worship these three million gods, you know, 20 or 30 from your area. They're in the fields and then the things you offer sacrifices. And all you're trying to do is appease them because they're not nice. They don't like you. They have no future. Uh, they're born into the caste, the lowest part of the caste, um, taken advantage of their whole life. And um, the only true answer is for them to come to know Jesus. When you hear the word mission, for a lot of people, uh, it, it is like um, going and buying M&Ms or uh, buying peanuts. It, it is a light-hearted, they don't understand. Missions is one of the most complex um, confusing thing if you really think about it uh, crossing a culture uh, and understanding it and uh, for us uh, you know uh, we have some 7,000 young people study in these 64 Bible colleges after three four years of their training uh, when we send them out I tell you there's a lot of emotions missionary work no matter when or where, is not going to be like a politician preaching a bunch of statements and come uh, and join us. No, it is life actually being poured out. And, and I, you know, I, I don't think the modern church, especially in America, um, understand what it takes because they leave out the cross and the suffering and they want to do it in the microwave way, put it in and um, 60 seconds, we got the tea. It don't work like that. Here in the 21st century, we have the benefit of learning from 2,000 years of Christian history. One clear lesson we find is that to flourish, churches must continually take the great commission given by Jesus Christ very seriously. So from the time when the very first hippie came down the aisle in bare feet at Sunflower and Fairview, evangelism has been and remains a huge priority. The Bible College campuses have used some unique locations for a new purpose. 
In California, Murrieta was a gambling spa for the Hollywood set. Training young people in the word so that they can go out and share the word has been of primary importance. And we presently have some 51 Bible colleges in the United States and around the world uh, that have come out of our Bible college. I grew so much in my time at Murrieta at the Bible college and also in York, England. Uh, being there in, a, in an old city of York and, and studying God's Word and learning Greek from a professor who taught at Cambridge and, and, uh, and, and you know, experiencing parts of church history. This is the castle Schloss Heroldeck overlooking the picturesque Austrian village of Milstadt. In 1938, this castle was purchased by the Nazis for 100,000 Reichsmark to become a training facility for SS officers. Hitler was there and they had their strategy sessions there in that castle. And so to see it, uh, you know, be transferred from that into a Bible college and sending young people out throughout Europe. It's gone from being uh, a place of raising up those who were to spread a uh, gospel of evil around the world to those that are spreading the gospel of good news. I taught at the Bible College, Calvary Chapel Bible College, uh, for three years. It's a very delicate balance to equip people in the authority of the Word of God to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ for the kingdom and not have, you know, elements of spiritual pride or discouragement of our own inadequacies. So Christian, higher Christian education and even biblical Christian education has to fight that challenge. Pastor Chuck's vision is a good one. We want to raise up people who believe the Bible is the Word of God. great work that God has done in the past and I just think down the road from my street literally is uh, Westminster Chapel which is uh, Lloyd Jones G Campbell Morgan but now there's nobody in there, there. It's, it's like it's like these these places have become a tomb a memorial of what happened a hundred years ago or, or, or less but now it's not happening anymore and that's that's what's happening or is not happening in England The lesson we can learn from the churches in England is simple and profound. Jesus warned that if a wineskin becomes rigid and dry, it would no longer be able to hold new wine. Remember, God is always refreshing the world with the new wine of His gospel. That is an unchanging truth. So the question remains, is our church willing to be firm in doctrine, but flexible in form? did not hold Jesus to that cross 2,000 years ago. Love did. Love for you. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Without pride. God is always at work, and I think what we see is certain seasons where He is working in greater numbers and depth. We call those periods of reformation or revival or renewal. The Jesus movement was that. God is still working today, but I'm not sure we've seen that same frequency and intensity as we did during the Jesus movement. The problem I can see in Calvary is there's a lot of people who might want to become celebrity. I don't think celebrity in itself is wrong if God puts you there. Miles McPherson played cornerback for the San Diego Chargers. Today, he is on the offense with the gospel, and he thinks the church is more than a sleeping giant. Sometimes we think that church is about being in a meeting and growing a big attendance to, uh, to have a crowd that learn the Bible. And of course, that's part of it, but really God has sent us here to bring hope to the world. Christianity has generally been known as the religion that calls sinners to repent of their sin, and that's half true. The other half is Christianity is the religion that calls religious people to repent of their religion. Even in the Calvary Chapel movement, I see that guys get a, they miss what Chuck Smith is about. They get a hold of it and they build a, maybe a big church and they hold on to everything 
where Chuck always let it go and let it go and let it go. Jesus um, walked on water, he rose the dead, he fed thousands of people with a few pieces of bread, all the stuff he did. And it was like he had a lot of nerve to say, you can do more than that. So we have to either say he's kind of just exaggerating <laughs> or he really meant it. Today, kids have sort of melded into the establishment and uh, it's, they're a harder generation, I believe, to reach today. I am totally blown away by what happened in the 60s and we have it today. It's not like the hippie days because it was a time of love. Today is a time of hate. All these people that are hurting, all these people who are going to these places to be medicated, those are places that Christians should be going to bring hope. We, we, we came to bring hope. And, we, and, and what Jesus did, what did he do? He walked around town, he touched people where they were. He engaged people in the community. We should be doing the same thing. It's not about my comfort, it's about his kingdom. And it's about reaching as many people as we can with the gospel. Plato famously said, he who tells the stories of society rules society. Well, who tells the story of our society? It's movies. There's no skate park, surfboard, kite board, snowboard, any board. You know, the ultimate is the Jesus board. Louis Giglio, Chris Tomlin, David Crowder, Charlie Hall, and Christian Stanfill, among others, are key ingredients in the passion movement. Louis and I had, um, we'd been friends for, for a little while, and he, he came to me one day and he said, you know, I'm, I have this idea, why don't you come lead a community group at uh, Passion of Five in Nashville. And a community group is really just, um, there's this big group of like 15,000 college students, but then we would break off the community groups of like 1,000. And there would be different worship leaders and speakers in each one of those groups. And so I was leading worship in one of those groups and it was amazing, an experience I'll never forget. Their conferences, also known as 268 Generation, are a worship and teaching event that began around American college campuses and have exploded into a worldwide movement. It's all about worshiping God, helping people know God, and helping people take that first step towards God. And whether they've taken a million steps or the first step, it's the same in helping people know God and walk with God and, and being introduced to God and, and to worship Him. By virtue of the number of people singing his songs in churches, Chris Tomlin, the most sung songwriter of any genre in the world, came out of the Jesus movement. My first exposure to worship music was, I was in, I was just in high school getting into college and I had these little um, tapes uh, and uh, CD recordings of uh, some thing from Choice, Re Choice Ministries that was in Texas and it was a guy leading it by the name of Louis Giglio and he had taken some of the songs that came out of Calvary Chapel and some of the songs that were, that came out of the Jesus movement and it was, it was really, it was the first time I was exposed to those songs and it was simple, simple songs and I remember just devouring it on guitar. I would just listen to those songs and just play it, you know, and learn to play them and just try to lead them whenever, whenever I would go lead and, and started truly trying to write songs like that. Levi Lusco is pastor of Fresh Life Church in the Flathead Valley of Montana. The school is such a, a vibrant icon in our, in our culture, tattoos, and, and, I, and I realized, you know, the, the, the gripping power of the cross in the first century resonated with death. And it sounds like a, an occult church or something like that, but then you tell them, hey, the most loving thing that ever happened, the most beautiful, romantic thing that ever happened, happened on a hill shaped like a skull. While Pedro Garcia pastors a Calvary Chapel in South Miami. The possibilities of what God can do are endless. We have a God that is active and alive among us, and I believe that the best is yet to come. I think we need to be able to keep our doctrine in a closed hand. That's not going anywhere but then our, our, our style in an open hand. The thing that happens to any movement that becomes trapped in its tradition is that it becomes inbred and it becomes ingrown and it's intoxicated by its own success. While meanwhile, back at the ranch, the world is changing at a million miles an hour. And if you aren't paying attention to that, that movement that was once vibrant, thriving, and doing great things, it's going to be diminished and it will plunge into the depths of irrelevancy. Pastors today, this emerging church business, are being told, listen, don't want to offend people. When you talk about the cross, when you talk about blood, when you talk about his death, this is offensive to people. We need to be more gentle and we need to be kind and we need to be loving. We need to show the grace of God, the love of God. God is a God of judgment. The minute you become so user-friendly uh, that you're not meeting Jesus, the Savior of the world, but instead Jesus, the casual friend, 
we miss the opportunity for any change. I don't believe that the church has to go into decline. Yes, there's a lot of people that don't know the Lord, but that for us is great opportunity. What we need to do is be salt, we need to be light, and we need to be people that are out there living the Great Commission. Instead, we drive by and we pray for them, we feel sorry for them, or we say things we shouldn't say about them. Instead of saying, no, I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna go to the, to the, to the bar, manager of the bar, and I'm gonna say, listen, uh, uh, every Friday night, I'm going to have a couple of cars, and if someone can't drive home, I'll take them home. We've really seen our people be on mission in their neighborhood, not coming in midweek for an event at the church, but really inviting their neighbors, reaching their community. If you don't make those connections, I think invariably you have people that are really good at going to events. The thing that would make me most sad is someone getting uh, maybe stuck in their ways or even going back to what was first originally left. The worst thing that could happen is the thing that we left in the first place is what we can be in danger of becoming. I travel a lot internationally and I'm not fully convinced. I see a lot of prosperity theology. Uh, I see a lot of uh, aberrant doctrine. I see a lot of abuse of spiritual authority, uh, kind of guruism. And not falling back into the apathy or Christianity becoming institutionalized in the sense of a form of religion and, re and denying the power is to stay in love with God's Word. When you just open the Bible up, whether it's in Manila or Kathmandu at the base of Mount Everest, as you just open the Bible up and, and let God speak for Himself, there's a powerful dynamic that's created. His Spirit always blesses the teaching of His Word. I look at America and I say, you know, we're on the precipice of another crisis. I mean, we're already in it. We're in an economic crisis. We're in a crisis in the Middle East. Uh, and you look back and you see some of the echoes of the 60s. You see confusion. You see fear. I think the church fears persecution. But the reality is the church has never been stronger than when it's persecuted. It was G. Campbell Morgan that said, the church persecuted has always been the church pure, but the church patronized has always been the church impure. How does the Jesus movement or any other fresh move of the Holy Spirit avoid becoming stiff and stale? Or can it? Can those in the Jesus movement finish strong and be part of the next wave? I would challenge every minister in town to look for where the hurting things are and go there and get out of your silly pews and brass candelabras and your fancy suits and help people. Christ says you'll always have the poor, but that doesn't mean that our role as a church is any less. We went to the mayor and said, how can we help you? And if churches just went out and asked, asked how they can help, they would be amazed at how many people say, can you clean that trash? There's only one plan A, there's no plan B. The church is plan A. And that's why I want to give my life to help building up the church. Part of the frustrating thing with this generation, I see, uh, I see lots of passion and not a lot of commitment or longevity. We need, we need God here, definitely. We need, we need something that will really impact the kids today because there's absolutely nothing here. Let's break through the walls and, be, and, and create something that, that the world could look at, look at and go, wow, there's something, something behind what they're singing about because this is, this is something that only a creator could give to one of his children. A lot of people have their things with the church nowadays, but the truth is, is the church is advancing. God's at work. He's at work. Just because we don't see, you know, 2,000 hippies having a Jesus rally at UCLA tomorrow doesn't mean he's not at work. The Jesus movement is just when Jesus lets loose in your life, you're passionate about him. I'm absolutely overwhelmed at what God has done surprised at what God has done. Nothing that has been planned on our part or strategized from our end. It is a, uh, something that can be duplicated because the fellows that have gone out have done the same thing and have had the same success uh, that we have experienced here. God still will honor His Word. He still wants to create a strong fellowship of believers, that koinonia. He also wants us to observe uh, the ordinances, and of course, He wants us above all to pray. And when we do these things, God will bless it. Will Calvary Chapel remain as a powerful movement that create a reformation in America and all over the world, wherever, um, the people went as missionaries and planted churches. I think the chance is better than anything else because of this one thing. Keep your focus right. Teach God's Word. All you need to do is go one day to Los Angeles or any major city of the United States or the world 
and see all the lost people in the world. How can you not preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to people that are perishing and are going to hell? Jesus said the Holy Spirit is like the wind, unseen and unpredictable, yet his effect is undeniable. We have seen how our generation and the world was changed because of what began here in California. But Jesus also said the harvest is ripe and the workers are few. So the question is not, how do we recapture the conditions of a previous time? The Bible makes it clear that God is always interested in reaching mankind with his love and grace. The question then becomes, are we willing to cooperate and get in the flow? This is Skip Heitzig, and you've been watching Riptide. Please make it home. Please make it home.